Ethics Commission uh, hearing uh, on pursuing accountability for atrocities. Um, and we may be joined by some others uh, as this goes on. But I should tell you in advance that uh, we've, been, we've been voting until close to 1 o'clock in the morning yesterday, so people may be a little bit late getting up. So, um, but, um, but today's hearing is part of a series that the Commission began in 2018 to identify ways the Congress could help strengthen the U.S. government's capacities to prevent mass atrocities against civilian populations. By mass atrocities, we mean large-scale, deliberate attacks against civilians, including genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and ethnic cleansing. These crimes often occur during armed, co armed conflict, as we saw during the armed conflicts in Central America and Colombia, and as we see them today uh, continue in Syria. Atrocities can also be due to state-directed repression, communal violence, or post-war retribution, as has happened with the Rohingya and in parts of Africa, or as we fear could occur with the Uyghurs. Preventing mass atrocities is a bipartisan concern that has inspired several recent bills, including the Elie Wiesel Genocide and Atrocities Prevention Act that became law in January of this year, and the Global Fragility Act, um, H.R. 2116, which the House passed in May and sent to the Senate, and I'm proud to have co-sponsored both of them. While these important pieces of legislation men mention transitional justice, they are not focused on accountability, the process of making sure that victims of terrible human rights abuses receive justice for what has been done to them. Victims have a right to justice under international human rights law, but it's a right that is mostly honored in the breach, even though most of us believe that punishment is a deterrent, and so part of preventing atrocities ought to be punishing those who are responsible for such brutal acts. During my years in Congress, I have seen over and over and over again how important justice is for victims and survivors of human rights abuses and how, and, and how hard it is to achieve. From the first case I worked on as a congressional aide, which was the 1989 murders of six Jesuit priests, their housekeeper, and her daughter in El Salvador during that country's civil war, through my recent meetings with advocates from China, Colombia, Russia, Syria, Sudan, and the list goes on, the demand for accountability is universal but goes unsatisfied far too often. At the same time, we know that impunity for human rights abuses fuels more abuses. According to the UN's framework uh, of, an, of analysis for atrocity crimes, lingering perceptions of injustice and the failure to recognize past crimes are two of the factors that signal the country's potential for further violence and atrocities. So this is why we're here today, to discuss what the United States government is already doing to advance accountability for grave human rights abuses, what, obstacles are, are, what, what the obstacles are to doing more, and how Congress can help. Uh, we will not exhaust the topic of accountability in this hearing. Uh, where, where, where there has been progress in achieving justice for victims of human rights abuses, it has taken national, regional, and international efforts over decades, making creative use of civil and criminal law and other mechanisms like truth commissions. But because this is the United States Congress, we will start today with U.S. law and practice. I know your testimonies include many recommendations, and I look forward to, uh, to hearing them. So. Um, uh, at this time, I want to introduce the, uh, the first panel. Um, and let me just say that um, before you start, and I'm familiar with, uh, let me get, wait, 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 let me do the, with my bio here. Uh, we have uh, uh, David Rubicki, uh was appointed Deputy Assistant Attorney General of the Criminal Division, United States Department of Justice in April 2017. Uh, during his tenure with the Criminal Division, Mr. Rubicki has overseen the Human Rights and Special Prosecution Section, the Organized Crime and Gang Section, and the Capital Case Section. Mr. Mr. Rubicki joined the Department of Justice in 2007, uh, and he earned his JD from Stanford Law School. Uh, Louis Rohde serves as Acting Assistant Director of uh, HSI, National Security Investigations Division, and SID. In, his cap in this capacity, he oversees the Human Rights Vi Violators and War Crimes Unit, as well as the Counterterrorism and Criminal Exploitation Unit. Mr. Rohde received a Master's of Arts degree in International Studies from the University of Miami, and he's a member of the Senior Executive Service. But let me just say, uh, be before you start, that I'm um, familiar with the work both of your agencies do to advance accountability uh, for atrocity crimes. Uh, less than two weeks ago, I saw the news that a Guatemalan national wanted for participating in the mass sexual assault 
uh, of indigenous women in R Rabinau uh, in the 1980s was detained here in the United States on an immigration charge. I very much appreciate this case and all the work that you do, and I'm eager to hear how we can help you uh, as uh, it, with your work going forward. Uh, in addition, the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission was very lucky to have Mike McVicker with ICE's Human Rights Law Section direct the commission for 15 months in the early um, days of its work. It was from Mike that I first became aware of the international human rights work happening within the Department of Justice and, uh, and the Department of Homeland Security. So I, uh, I also I want to note that we did invite the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Office of Global Criminal Justice at the Department of State to appear today. Both agencies were unable to be here, but my appreciation of the U.S. government's efforts on accountability extends to them as well. So all your testimonies are accepted uh, for the record. Uh, at this time, I'd also like to enter for the record testimony submitted by David M. Crane, Chief Prosecutor of the Special Court for Sierra Leone, founder of the Syrian Accountability Project and the Yemeni Accountability Project, and a retired member of the Senior Executive Service of the United States. So having said that, um, I will begin with Mr. Rubicki. Mr. Chairman, on behalf of the Department of Justice, thank you for inviting me to testify today. Pursuing justice on behalf of victims of atrocities is a mission of great importance. As the Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Criminal Division who supervises a key participant in that mission, the Human Rights and Special Prosecutions Section, known as HRSP, I'm pleased to address the Department's ongoing efforts against the perpetrators of atrocity crimes and other human rights and humanitarian law offenses. Bringing the perpetrators of atrocity crimes and other human rights violations to justice has been a priority at the Department for more than four decades since the former Office of Special Investigations was created in 1979 to take legal action against participants in Nazi-era acts of persecution. Today, the Criminal Division's human rights enforcement efforts are centered at HRSP, which works closely with U.S. Attorney's offices, other sections within DOJ, and our law enforcement partners, including the FBI's International Human Rights Unit and HSI. DOJ pursues accountability for human rights violations on multiple fronts, including supporting U.S. government efforts to prevent perpetrators from gaining entrance to our country. When perpetrators do enter the United States, we work aggressively to identify, investigate, and prosecute these individuals. In cases in which domestic prosecution is not possible or appropriate, we seek to denaturalize, extradite, or otherwise transfer suspects to stand trial abroad or support DHS in its removal efforts. Our work principally targets human rights abusers who have engaged in genocide, torture, war crimes, recruitment or use of child soldiers, female genital mutilation, and immigration and naturalization fraud relating to concealment of these offenses. DOJ is committed to bringing criminal prosecutions against such individuals where we have jurisdiction to do so. As I'll discuss later, however, the jurisdictional reach of some of our statutes is one of the challenges we face. Notwithstanding those challenges, we have had significant success. In May 2019, for example, HRSP secured a 37-month sentence for an Ethiopian human rights abuser who had obtained U.S. citizenship illegally. During the period known as the Red Terror in Ethiopia, the defendant severely abused detainees on account of their political opinion. The defendant later made his way to the U.S. and was ultimately discovered here by one of his victims. In this case, as in most of our immigration and naturalization cases, the department argued for a sentence significantly above the sentencing guidelines range of zero to six months to ensure that this kind of egregious violation of our immigration laws is punished appropriately. Other successes include a 57-month sentence against a Bosnian detention camp guard who, among other abuses, used a knife to carve a cross into a Muslim prisoner's chest. We also brought a groundbreaking series of criminal prosecutions targeting former members of a Guatemalan Special Forces unit that massacred approximately 200 inhabitants of the village of Doceres, Guatemala, in one of the most notorious atrocities in Central American history. We continue our work to wind up Nazi-era matters as well, including a success this past August when the United States accomplished the removal to Germany of Nazi persecutor Yaakov Pali through a highly effective interagency effort by DOJ, 
ICE, and the State Department. We are proud of this work and other work I discuss in greater detail in my written submission. As I mentioned earlier, we face a number of challenges in bringing these cases. Some of the statutes we work with have significant jurisdictional, temporal, and evidentiary limitations. Some theories of liability, such as command responsibility, may be available in international law or U.S. civil law, but are generally not available in a criminal context. Some prosecutions also may be barred by short statutes of limitations. In addition, experience has shown that these kinds of investigations are extremely complex. The activities at the heart of our cases occurred in foreign countries, often many years ago, and frequently took place in the context of political instability, war, or social upheaval. Notwithstanding these challenges, DOJ remains deeply committed to fulfilling our mission to bring human rights violators and perpetrators of atrocity crimes to justice using any lawful tools at our disposal. We are also committed to working with DHS and our other interagency partners in furthering efforts to ensure that America is not a safe haven for human rights violators. I thank this commission for the invitation to appear today and for its commitment to these important issues, and I'm pleased to take any questions you have. Thank you very much, Mr. Rohde. Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the commission, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the work the Human Rights Violators and War Crimes Center performs in holding human rights abusers accountable and how that work contributes to preventing future atrocities. The center is an interagency task force led by U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement. The center is also comprised of a number of partners to include the FBI, the Department of Justice, the Departments of State and Defense, and the intelligence community. ICE established the center in 2008 to dedicate resources to our mission of ensuring the United States does not become a safe haven for human rights abusers. The center focuses on its mission in two primary ways, by identifying, investigating, prosecuting, and removing human rights violators and war criminals found within the jurisdiction of the United States, and by preventing suspected violators from entering the U.S. It also works with foreign law enforcement, international partners, and tribunals to further global accountability. The center brings together special agents, intelligence specialists, analysts, historians, and attorneys with expertise in specific regional areas or conflicts. These team members, joined by our center partners, are organized into investigative regional support teams which cover the entire globe. In 2016, the center created a team dedicated to the elimination of female genital mutilation of girls in the United States, and in 2018, the center created an investigative team dedicated to developing targets who were responsible for human rights violations that could be sanctioned under the Global Magnitsky Human Rights Accountability Act. The center is also home to the Human Rights Target Tracking Team. By placing lookouts in appropriate databases, this team works with our interagency partners to prevent human rights violators from entering the U.S. and obtaining U.S. immigration benefits. Dedicated funding provided by Congress in 2016 resulted in a significant increase in resources dedicated to the center's work. In 2014, ICE's Homeland Security Investigations, HSI, had eight investigators and intelligence specialists assigned to the center. Today, HSI has 23 dedicated agents, analysts, intelligence specialists, and historians researching, investigating, and supporting the important work of the center. Including our partners, the center now has a team of 50 people dedicated to our mission. This dedicated funding has led to a higher number of criminal indictments and arrests of human rights violators. The center's commitments to its mission is illustrated in various cases from around the world. I would like to highlight one of these cases and have elaborated on several others in my written statement. Mohamed Jabate served as a general in a rebel group that battled for control of Liberia in the 1990s. During the investigation, HSI agents, center researchers, and members of the U.S. Attorney's Office traveled to Liberia to interview over 30 eyewitnesses who provided firsthand accounts of acts of torture, rape, cannibalism, and murder committed by Jabate and his followers. Our investigation and the successful prosecution of Jabate by the U.S. Attorney's Office in Philadelphia resulted in his conviction and subsequent sentence in April 2018 to 30 years incarceration well above the sentencing guidelines for these crimes and the highest sentence ever received for an immigration fraud conviction related to human rights violator. It is important to acknowledge a broad range of intergovernmental bodies and NGOs who have assisted ICE with identifying potential suspects, witnesses, and victims, as well as providing crime scene information. In some cases, evidence from criminal proceedings in a foreign country has been key to litigating cases in the United States. Judicial proceedings following our investigations underscore, underscore the role U.S. courts play in seeking accountability for human rights abuses committed abroad, as well as in the broader efforts of justice and atrocities prevention. 
Today, ICE is handling more than 1,600 human rights-related cases. They involve suspects from approximately 95 countries, primarily in Central and South America, the Balkans, and Africa. HSI has more than 170 active human rights investigations. Since 2003, ICE has successfully removed more than 990 known or suspected human rights violators from the U.S. Through the 75,000 subject re records created, HSI has prevented over 300 suspected violators from entering the U.S. The center continues to grow and expand its mission. HSI is currently developing Operation War Crimes Hunter, a repository of photos of individuals suspected of participating in human rights abuses. The center is developing prevention records and potential leads by utilizing information received from civil society and NGOs regarding human rights abuses and atrocities committed by the Syrian regime. While we acknowledge and celebrate our collaborative work to date, we understand that much remains to be done. Weaknesses in our immigration statutes may allow human rights violators to enter the U.S. and obtain immigration benefits. At times, we are confronted with serious obstacles in our investigations based on the statute of limitations for crimes such as immigration or naturalization fraud. In many instances, the U.S. government must forego criminal charges because evidence of the offender's misrepresentations did not come to light within the statute of limitations. Nevertheless, our successes underscore the Center's deep commitment to denying human rights violators safe haven in the United States. Chairman and members of the committee, I applaud your continued leadership on these important issues. Thank you again for the opportunity to address this commission. I'd be pleased to answer any questions. Well, thank you very much. And, um, and before I get into questions, let me, let, me, uh, let me apologize to the audience. Um, you know, this Hillary Clinton says it takes a village. I say it takes a bigger room. Um, and uh, I think, uh, but you, you more than feel free to come up and sit around here, but uh, I, just, I feel bad everybody's standing in the back. But uh, in any event, um, uh, but it's inspiring that so many people have come out because this is an important topic. And I want to thank both of you for your, for your testimony. I appreciate it uh, very much. And, and um, we, we are going to, um, we're going to abbreviate uh, this a little bit uh, because uh, we're going to probably have votes at 1130. And, uh, and, and, and we may have 30 or 40 votes, so we're, we're going to make sure we get everybody in here. So if we don't get all to the questions, we may actually submit some questions in writing as well. But let me ask you, about, you know, what are the factors that guide DHS and DOJ decisions on what suspected human rights violated cases to investigate and ultimately to prosecute? And, and how do legal and evidentiary challenges affect your decisions? Um, thank you for the, Congress, uh, the, the question, Congressman. Uh, there's a number of factors that are at play in criminal prosecutions, I think, um, that wouldn't necessarily uh, be considerations for other players in this space, like NGOs. Right. Obviously, we have to bring our cases in the federal criminal court. Rules of evidence apply, and all of our cases have to be proven to the very stringent, uh, beyond a reasonable doubt, um, standard. So we consider all of those issues when we look at um, information that comes to our attention and when we're investigating human rights violations, whether they be um, genocide, torture, war crimes, or the other substantive statutes that we work with. Um, as, as you mentioned, there are difficulties in investigating these cases. They're extremely complicated right. cases. And our prosecutors, our human rights prosecutors, face challenges that um, other federal prosecutors typically don't. Uh, a crime scene, more often than not, in, uh, in the case of our human rights cases, is going to be in a war zone or someplace where the uh, federal prosecutor or investigators will have great difficulty uh, gaining access uh, to evidence of potential human rights violations. If they are able to gain access, it will usually be long after any violations have, have occurred. Um, frequently, there are problems obtaining documents from hostile governments, uh, chaotic uh, situations or corrupt police forces or other foreign government agencies. Oftentimes it's difficult to establish the admissibility of documents from um, foreign governments in uh, U.S. criminal courts. Um, and then in terms of other evidence like witness testimony, oftentimes given the, the lag between a human rights violation and our ability to investigate the violation, witnesses will be difficult, if not impossible, to locate. They will be dead oftentimes, or um, in, in many cases uh, that we've had in the past, the witnesses will themselves have been involved in perpetrating atrocities, crimes, or human rights violations. And those are individuals that we have to be very careful about bringing to the United States to testify in a, in a criminal proceeding. 
So those are all the, the kinds of considerations and challenges that, that our prosecutors face when, when looking at um, our statutes. And so often, if, if we can't use those statutes, we use whatever other tools we can uh, and, and have our, at our disposal to, to seek accountability. So in regards to the question is where do we get our cases, so the primary um, avenue for our cases is the victims themselves. When victims come forward uh, with the information of uh, you know, alleged acts of persecution, torture, war crimes, uh, that sort of thing, um, that's, that's a starting point for us to begin an investigation. Um, with that information, we have a whole team dedicated to investigating um, the statements by these witnesses. We have teams of researchers at the center. We have historians. Um, thankfully, we've been able to hire a number of historians based on the funding provided in 2016. We have intelligence analysts. And, and of course, we have our partners at the center who bring a lot of information to the table. We work with NGOs. We work with uh, other government agencies uh, within the federal government to, uh, to develop our leads and to follow up on the further investigations. And of course, once we uh, package that information up, we, we send it out to the field for further investigation. Thank you. So news reporting earlier this year indicated that the FBI's International Human Rights Unit, IHRU, may be eliminated and its responsibilities shifted to other offices. Uh, is that accurate? Is that, are you hearing that as well? I mean, because in your testimony, you note that IHRU leverages the efforts of all 56 F FBI field offices and 63 legal attache offices around the world. And if it might be eliminated, how might the elimination affect FBI participation in ISIS human rights violators of war crime center? Um, Congressman, the, um, I don't think any final decisions have been made in that regard in terms of what FBI participation will be in the center. Uh, following a, a reorganization. But um, I, I can tell you that I've been in my job for the last two years supervising HRSP and the work that they do, um, and I've come to know our colleagues at FBI uh, in other parts of DOJ and the U.S. Attorney's offices and at HSI, and I'm very confident that irrespective of uh, whatever s uh, structural reorg that FBI undertakes in this respect, um, we're going to be able to fulfill our mission going forward. Um, they have uh, subject matter experts and consummate professionals at FBI that uh, have made their, the calling of their career these kinds of cases, and those people are, are going to be working these cases moving forward. So if the org chart changes, um, I'm, I'm not concerned that we'll be able to fulfill, to fulfill our mission with, um, with the quality people that we have. Brody. Sir, the Human Rights Violators and War Crimes Center is a shining example of interagency collaboration within the U.S. government. Having the FBI co-located within the center has allowed ICE to work side by side with our law enforcement partners in our joint mission. The reduced participation of any members of the, uh, the center would be detrimental to the mission. And the FBI is no exception to that. So if I'm hearing you correctly, I mean, are you hearing the same rumors we're hearing that, that, um, that the, um, that this op that that office might be eliminated is, is that is that part of, is that are you hearing similar rumors? I, I have not heard that specifically. All right. um, and like I said, I don't think any final decisions All right. All have been made in terms of what kind of structural reorganization FBI is undertaking right now. We have a couple more uh, questions. Yeah. So DOJ officials have described human rights cases as sometimes quote difficult, time consuming, and resource intensive end quote, in large part because of the sizable time gap, and you just talked about that, uh, Mr. Rubicki, and uh, between the crimes uh, that were, when, when they were committed and when, the, and when they are investigated and when they are prosecuted. Do D DOJ and DHS have sufficient resources to pursue these cases? And what, if anything, could be done in terms of changes to law or policy to help overcome the time gap difficulties? Sir, um to answer your questions in terms of resources, I would have to say that these cases are very expensive to conduct. They require extensive travel, witness location, translation services, and of course we could do more with more resources. Travel for agents to conduct interviews, travel for witnesses to come to the United States, victim support services for witnesses, all cost a lot. For example, a trip for two agents to travel to Rwanda 
to fund interview uh, to find and interview witnesses costs over sixty five thousand dollars. That's twenty percent of our annual budget. Um, I think there are concrete steps that Congress can take to help us uh, prosecute the mission the mission better, uh, Congressman. As as you know, the FGM statute was recently held by a federal district court to be unconstitutional, um, and that is uh, a significant uh, hit to one of the tools in our arsenal in terms of combating uh, that specific kind of human rights violation. Uh, the department has submitted uh, specific legislative text to Congress regarding um, our suggestions about how Congress can amend Section 116 of the Criminal Code so that uh, the FGM statute will pass constitutional muster. So we would, we would urge Congress to, to take a look at, at that section to, um, and to address the, the shortcomings that the, the court found in that case in, in Detroit. Uh, we're happy to, to work with you on that, but that's, that's a step that Congress can take right now to assist us in prosecuting um, those important cases. The State Department's Office of Global Criminal Justice heads U.S. efforts to cooperate with foreign justice systems and international tribunals to ensure accountability for perpetrators of atrocity crimes globally. Do your agencies coordinate and cooperate with the Office of Global Criminal Justice, and if so, how? Absolutely, Congressman. Um, that office in the State Department is uh, one of our many interagency partners. They uh, serve as a clearinghouse for information across the, uh, the federal government. Much of that information ultimately is going to make its way into potential federal and criminal investigations and prosecutions. And um, much of the, the work that they do is really invaluable to how we collect information and, and build our cases. So the, that office at State is, is a key partner in our, our whole of government approach to um, maintaining accountability for human rights violators. Sir, in terms of the State Department, we do have the State Department as part of the center. Uh, we work mainly with consular affairs uh, and also the Department of State uh, Diplomatic Security Service as well. And, and how, what about the other way around? I mean, this, uh, the work that you're doing, I mean, do you provide information to, you know, international, other international justice activities to help them, you know, um, pursue justice? I mean, I mean, do you work with them that way as well, not just getting information from them, but giving information to them? Absolutely. We have international partners, and our prosecutors and leadership at HRSP, including myself, routinely meet with our international partners um, in The Hague through the Eurojust right. um, organs as part of the, uh, the EU uh, to share know-how, compare notes, and look at the kinds of investigations they're doing seeing whether or not uh, issues that they're uncovering can translate into U.S. criminal prosecutions and vice versa. Um, and we've, we have a, a good track record in the past of taking a look at our cases, and if we can't accomplish what we want to in a U.S. criminal court, um, seeking extradition and getting human rights violators from the United States into a foreign tribunal, where um, they can face accountability if for whatever fact-specific reasons involving that case, prosecution is more difficult here. And I, I, let me have one last question before I turn it over to my colleague, Congresswoman Omar, um, and I'm really thrilled that she's here. Um, what measures can DOJ and, and or DHS take to hold perp a perpetrator accountable when he or she is a U.S. citizen or a green card holder? For example, the case of uh, Sri Lanka, the former defense secretary, I don't even want to begin to pronounce his name, I'll mess it up, uh, and, a, and a, US citizen, um, uh, a U.S. citizen, and then Sarah Fonseca, a U.S. green card holder, are alleged to be responsible for atrocities in that country. Um, and then added to that, I mean, you know, I spent a lot of time in the 1980s uh, on human rights issues in El Salvador. Um, and there were many people who are, were guilty of atrocities um, who cooperated with U.S. intelligence services uh, during that war, but nonetheless came to the United States and, you know, were granted asylum or given, you know, uh, legal status. Um, how does that work as well? I mean, if in fact you have somebody who is in the United States um, who is guilty of atrocities but came here as part of a deal with another U.S. agency, how does, how does, how does that work? Uh, Congressman, to address the, the first part of your question, um, 
the, uh, the department has a lot of tools at its disposal, and uh, all of our substantive human rights statutes, uh, war crimes, genocide, torture, child soldiers, uh, we have jurisdiction over U.S. citizens, whether or not, um, for example, in the torture statute, right. the uh, jurisdiction that Congress has given us allows us to prosecute U.S. citizens uh, who have committed acts of torture abroad. And the department um, has, in fact, used that statute to prosecute a U.S. citizen, Chucky e. Taylor, the son of the former um, Liberian dictator who received a 97-year sentence um, for those atrocity crimes that he, that he perpetrated. So we have a track record here. Um, all of our uh, human rights statutes apply to U.S. citizens, and um, given the facts of any case, we, we, will, we will certainly look at, at the prosecution of, of U.S. nationals. Um, with respect to bringing witnesses here from, from foreign countries, it's, I'd say it's really a case-specific uh, consideration that prosecutors have to use. Um, of course, we will talk with um, our immigration enforcement partners at DHS. And there's also internal uh, dialogue at the department as to what is the specific evidentiary value of the witness, what is the U.S. government's previous relationship with the witness, um, and how would the witness uh, enter the United States, whether on a specialized visa, would the witness be paroled into the United States. So it's really dependent upon the witness's role in the case and the specific, specific facts of that case. I, I guess what I'm getting at, I mean, and, and thank you for your answer, but in cases where um, you know, let's, let's, in the case of El Salvador, during the 1980s was our ally. We supported the Salvadoran military uh, during that war, um, and yet we know that there, are, there were mass crimes uh, that occurred, terrible human rights atrocities that occurred in that, in that country during that time. Uh, there were some, uh, uh, and we had taken sides in that war, but there were some individuals associated with the military who were granted access to the United States, and I think you know, worked out deals with other agencies, you know, um, I think for their own, they thought when the war ended, they'd be better not to be in that country, but nonetheless um, may have been guilty of, of uh, perpetrating these crimes. I just want to, I mean, you, you are separate and detached from, let's say the CIA made a deal with somebody to come to the United States um, and uh, in exchange for information, that's not a deterrent for you to be able to pursue that case if, it, if evidence comes out that that individual was involved in, in atrocities, would it? Well, I, it would depend, like I say. And in terms of actually allowing that individual access to the United States, I'd have to de defer to my colleagues at DHS because that's not uh, something that the, the DOJ regulates directly. Sir, if we uncover crimes uh, committed by a person that was given a special deal by an intelligence agency, we would coordinate with that intelligence agency to find out exactly what the, what the deal is. What was, what was the deal? What was the information provided? And we would take it, obviously it would be a case-by-case -case basis, but if the person committed a crime and we have some substantive evidence that the person committed a crime, regardless of whatever deal was made, we're going to pursue the case. That's our job. That's what we do. We investigate. And if we find evidence of crimes that were committed um, regardless of whether or not the person received a deal to get here, we're going to investigate that case. We'll de-conflict with the intelligence agency who gave him the deal, but ultimately our job is to, is to pursue the evidence against that person for committing the crime. Thank you. I'm happy to turn this over to Congresswoman Ilan Omar from Minnesota. Uh, thank you, Chairman um, McGovern uh, and um, your co-chair, Mr. Smith. Um, I'm sure he'll join us. Um, thank you so much for being here, and thank you all for um, joining us as well. The United States has been a leader on international justice and accountability for atrocities since Nuremberg. This is something we should all be proud of, and <clears throat> even if our record isn't always perfect. I uh, believe applying <clears throat> rule of law to foreign affairs is fundamental to our values and our interests. It's central to my vision for how our foreign policy should be run. I have been disturbed by um, this administration's active hostility to the norms and institutions of international justice and accountability. And I will have some questions in, in regards to some specific policies um, for this panel. 
But first, I wanted to look at some of the structural barriers that we're dealing with um, and how we might be able to expand the toolbox that you have to per pursue accountability for war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. Um, so, Mr. Rybicki, yeah. I want to start with you. Um, if war crimes uh, against if war crimes against humanity or genocide are committed by U.S. citizens abroad, um, sort of in the same line of what um, my colleague was asking, does the Department of Justice have jurisdiction to investigate and prosecute? Yes, uh, Congresswoman. Our war crime statute, genocide statute, and torture statutes all apply to U.S. citizens. Wonderful. Um, can you give us uh, specific examples of when we have been able to use them? Uh, yes, the example that I um, just provided to um, uh, the congressman regarding Chucky e. Taylor and his uh, conviction for under the torture statute. He was a U.S. citizen who committed uh, acts of torture abroad and received a very lengthy sentence. The other statutes um, that I mentioned have not resulted in prosecutions of U.S. citizens, um, but we uh, have ongoing investigations, of course, using those statutes, and we consider them important tools that Congress has given us to address uh, human rights abuses committed by U.S. citizens. We, um, we have other tools other than those statutes um, that, uh, that can compensate, and these are jurisdictional tools that Congress has given us involving uh, our ability to prosecute U.S. citizens abroad. Uh, for example, the Military Extraterritorial Jurisdiction Act, or MEJA jurisdiction, has given DOJ the power to prosecute, uh, for example, a U.S. serviceman who was convicted and sentenced to life without the possibility of parole for the rape and murder of an Iraqi child and the murder of her family. Uh, so that is an example of a serious human rights violation that the department charged against a U.S. citizen um, that did not involve specifically the human rights statutes. So like I say, we are focused more on the, the nature of the violations rather than a specific code section and, on, and what that code section can give us. We use all the tools that, that we have. Another tool in addition to media jurisdiction is the special uh, maritime and extraterritorial jurisdiction of the United States. That allows us to reach outside of the United States and prosecute conduct committed by U.S. citizens abroad. And um, what are the barriers when it comes to diplomatic immunity? So I'm um, obviously for the case with the U.S. citizen who was um, the Defense Secretary of Sri Lanka, um, or I'm thinking about ha Haftar in, in Libya, who recently in the news was recorded in saying, um, do all you can and, and kill um, uh, as many people as, as you can, or something to that effect. Um, and we know that there are many U.S. citizens who become um, who go back to serve in, in their country in, in diplomatic ways, and so are there, are there barriers in, in prosecuting those that might have diplomatic immunity? Um, Congresswoman, I can't talk about uh, specific cases or investigations, of course, but, but what I can say is that we are mustering all of the, the tools um, that I, I previously mentioned, whether they are our substantive human rights statutes, whether they are immigration naturalization laws for non-U.S. citizens, obviously, or whether it's the special jurisdictional tools that Congress has given us uh, to look at extraterritorial conduct. We use all of those things um, when we're considering how we can seek accountability for U.S. citizens who are committing atrocities, crimes, or other humanitarian law uh, violations um, outside of the United States. And in regards to um, coordination uh, with, let's the the, the FBI, uh, DHS, um, and the State Department, um, can any of these departments initiate investigation, and does one of them have veto power over a potential investigation? I, I didn't hear the last part of your question, Congressman. I apologize. Does any agency have veto power over potential investigation? Oh, veto power. Um, well, we are the, the criminal investigators at DOJ, and um, 
typically in my experience, that's going to mean that we're either working with our folks at FBI or we're working with HSI. I'm not aware, aware of any uh, veto power uh, over whether or not DOJ can initiate an investigation. So, Rodi, uh, uh, um, in, in regards to what um, Mr. McGovern was asking, if um, we've decided that there, there is um, a potential interest in, in bringing someone who might be accused of, of war crime, um, and they might have de made a deal with some agency, um, and one agency decides that they might want to pursue does that agency get to say, no, you can't touch this person? I guess that's what I'm trying to get at. Is that, is that a practice? We work collaboratively. We coordinate with each other. No agency has veto power over the other. Um, if, if there are strong concerns one way or another, is what direction the investigation should go or should we look the other way? We're never going to look the other way in terms of a, a crime. Um, but we will listen to our partners as to the underlying reasons why a person is here. Um, I, I can give you an example of there, there are many people, like you s suggested, people who've committed war crimes and now become part of a government in a, in a foreign country. The regime changed. And that person has diplomatic status, diplomatic immunity, and they travel to the United States for various diplomatic functions on an A visa, which is a dip diplomatic visa. But let's say that person wants to come here to visit the United States, and they, ha they apply for a B visa, visitor visa, because they want to go to Disneyland or they want to come shopping. Well, we can prevent that from happening because the, you know, the, there are grounds of inadmissibility for the crimes, the alleged crimes that that person may or may not have committed. We can, we can deny that type of visa visitor. But if they remain on an A, visitor, uh, a visa, a diplomatic visa, our hands are tied. That person can enter freely. Um, on that diplomatic immunity. But uh, other types of visas, we do have the say, and um, um, we're going to make our recommendations for refusal of that visa. Uh, President um, Trump has recently mentioned the possibility of granting uh, executive pardons to U.S. personnel convicted under the U.S. law for atrocity um, crimes. What's your opinion on such pardons? I can't really speak to that. Uh, Congresswoman, I'm familiar that there have been media reports in that respect. I haven't read them. I don't know what they're based on. And so um, I would be reluctant to comment on rumors or on unspecified reporting. Um, and do such pardons or statements uh, supporting such pardons affect the position of the United States that perpetuation of atrocity crimes must be brought to justice? Um, Congresswoman, DOJ has a very um, delineated and specific role. We, we are the criminal prosecutors. We are not uh, diplomats in the formal sense, and we perform our work apolitically. The career men and women of the department um, investigate crimes and prosecute those crimes without respect to political considerations. And so um, whatever the political branches may be doing, um, it's not something that affects our work. Um, Mr. Rohde, when DHS puts suspected or accused uh, violators of human rights in removal um, proceedings, can you describe the coordination with the governments of their home countries? Sure. It, it's a case-by-case -case basis. depends on where the person is being removed to. Um, but we do notify that, that country that we're removing that person um, for the violations that they were accused of that, that was resulting in their removal. We coordinate with those foreign governments. Some foreign governments um, will prosecute these people for the crimes that they committed in their, in their countries. Others will not. It depends on the political situation in those countries. If there's a general amnesty, for example, uh, for a time of conflict where atrocities were committed and those people are removed to those countries, then um, it's, it's out of our hands. Other countries, um, uh, the former Yugoslavic republics, for example, are very willing to prosecute some of these folks when they're, re when they're removed. And earlier you um, referenced a uh, statute of limitation for prosecution. What's the, what's the time on that? So for uh, visa fraud, 18 U.S.C. 1546, the statute of limitations is five years. And that statute is, isn't from the time we discover it. It's from the time that it occurred. 
So if we don't discover that the, the fraud has been committed in the visa application until after that five-year period, um, that's tied our hands. Um, for naturalization fraud, the statute of limitations is 10 years, and the same would apply. Um, there, there was a case a, a while back um, of uh, a general from Somalia who was accused of um, crimes doing, you might not have the details and I'm, I'm not asking what happened in the case, so this is like a hypothetical question that I will get to. Um, so he, he was accused of, of crimes that was committed under the Siad Bari regime. Um, and I remember there being uh, specific limitations on uh, prosecuting him as a U U.S. citizen. Uh, and I just wonder what, what kind of limitations could arise that we could uh, figure out a way to legislate against. Have you, have you seen cases like that where there, there is um, a citizen, they've been accused of atrocities, but we have been unable to prosecute because of A, B, and C. Well, in, in the realm of immigration related matters, so if, it's a, if, the, if the citizen is a naturalized citizen, we're going to review the A file. And we're gonna review the, the, the conditions of naturalization. We're gonna review the, uh, the application. If there was fraud committed in the application, and we can go as far back as when they applied uh, initially to be a permanent resident first and then um, follow on to become a citizen, but if, if, the, if the violation, or if we didn't re receive information regarding the violation ent until after this, the toll of the statute of limitations has passed, then we can't prosecute for that crime. We have to find out that the violation was committed within that time period of the statute. So let's say that the person committed, uh, filled out their nap naturalization application 15 years ago and we're finding out about now. Well, this, because the statute of limitation is 10 years, we can't charge that violation for the naturalization fraud. And do you know why these sort of statute of limitations have been set? I, I don't know. Or if, if we've thought about changing them? Because uh, it just seems arbitrary. Congress, Congress created the laws. <laughs> but I'll say, I'll say this. Given your hypo, uh, a case that I mentioned in my uh, opening remarks is, is kind of a, a similar real-world example. We had a defendant who, uh, during the 1970s, committed uh, human rights violations in Ethiopia. He subsequently comes to the United States. He subsequently obtains U.S. citizenship. He's seen by one of his victims. Well, when he committed the human rights violations, he wasn't a U.S. citizen. Um, and his victims were not U.S. citizens, and they occurred in the 1970s. So our substantive statutes are, are now out. We can't use those. However, we can use the important tools in the immigration context to, uh, to charge him with criminal immigration, uh, naturalization fraud, um, and, and obtain some measure of accountability uh, in that situation. So Only if it is within the statute of limitations. For the immigration violations, yeah. because the, the, the statutes or his, his conduct predated the existence of our human rights laws. Um, and even if they didn't, the, the nationality of the victims and the defendants would preclude our use of those substantive statutes. That's why the, the teamwork between DOJ and DHS on these matters is so key, because if we can't use human rights laws, we can't use false statements or perjury or something. In our toolbox in Title 18, oftentimes we can use immigration violations and obtain significant penalties for human rights violators. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to yield back. But I, I, I mean, I think this is um, another example of, of sometimes how statute of limitations could be a hindrance. I understand that there's a purpose for them because, you know, there might be loss of memory, loss of evidence, and all of these things. It's the same in, in regards to a lot of rape cases. And, and when I was in the Minnesota House, um, we worked on trying to get rid of some of the statute of limitations for um, sexual assault. And I think it's maybe important that we reevaluate and, and, and think about getting rid of some of these statute of limitations so that victims might have um, more justice and, and people know that they can't trump on our laws. Well, thank you. Um, and thank, I want to thank you both for being here. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think this is an incredibly important topic because, as, as I said at the beginning, I mean, uh, victims have a right to, to justice. Um, 
and um, and if we, if that doesn't occur, then it, then we have impunity, and we know that impunity um, for human rights abuses fuels more human rights abuses, uh, and uh, even if not by that individual person, it, the next person that comes along believes they can get away with it, uh, and um, and again in this context of trying to prevent mass atrocities from occurring, I mean our strong ability to be able to hold these people accountable, I think, is, is incredibly important. And uh, so I appreciate you both being here. Thank you for your testimony, and thank you for your work. And uh, we may have some follow-up questions in writing, but, uh, but I appreciate you being here this, this, uh, this morning. So thank you. Uh, we're going to go to our next panel. Uh, C. Dixon Osborne is the Executive Director of the Center for Justice and Accountability, an international human rights organization based in San Francisco that holds perpetrators of atrocity crimes accountable through litigation, policy advocacy, and transitional justice. And Beth Van Schrock, uh, did I say? Uh, yeah. Uh, is, the, is the Leah Kaplan Visiting Professor in Human Rights at Stanford Law School. Uh, prior to returning to acad academia, she serves as deputy to the ambassador at large for war crimes issues in the Office of Global Criminal Justice of the U.S. State Department, where she advised the Secretary of State and Under Secretary for Civilian Security, Democracy, and Human Rights on the formulation of U.S. policy regarding the prevention and accountability for mass atrocities. Um, and so we welcome you both here. And um, either one of you can start off. Mr. Dixon, you want to begin? I mean, Mr. Osborne, you want to begin? Sir, thank you. Yeah, you put your microphone on. What do a candy maker, Uber driver, and school bus driver have in common? They are all individuals living in the United States that the Center for Justice and Accountability has accused of committing atrocity crimes abroad. Good morning, Chairman McGovern, Reps of Omar, distinguished members of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission. Thank you for holding this timely hearing as we commemorate the 75th anniversary of D-Day and the 70th anniversary of the Geneva Conventions. World War II's clarion call of never again has yet to be achieved. My name is Dixon Osborne. I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Justice and Accountability. The candy maker was Colonel Innocente Montano, one of the 20 individuals that the Center for Justice and Accountability alleges is responsible for the Jesuits' massacre in 1989. In 2008, CJA and the Spanish Association for Human Rights filed criminal charges in Spain against the former president of El Salvador and 19 other members of the military uh, for the massacre. The Spanish court issued indictments against all accused, and all but one of the defendants lived in El Salvador. The one who did not was Colonel Innocente Montano, uh, the former vice minister of public security who had been living outside of Boston. As a result of the indictment in Spain and CJA's advocacy, the Tar Department of Homeland Security filed immigration fraud charges against Montano. He was sentenced to 21 months in prison. Subsequently, the Department of Justice secured his extradition to Spain, where Colonel Montano currently awaits trial. A special note of thanks to Chairman McGovern for your longstanding commitment to justice and accountability for the people of El Salvador. The Uber driver was Virginia resident Colonel Yusuf Abdi Ali, whom on May 21, 2019, this year, a Virginia jury found responsible under the Torture Victim Protection Act for the torture of our client, Farhan Warfa, who suffered barbaric torture as part of a systematic and widespread attack against his clan under the Siad Bayar regime in Somaliland. The school bus driver is a Boston resident, Jean Moros Villena, the current, the current mayor of a town in Haiti, whom we allege led an armed group of supporters in a campaign of terror against media activists and human rights defenders. That case is still ongoing. The Center for Justice and Accountability is a nonprofit international human rights organization. Our mission is to deter torture, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and other severe human rights abuses around the world through litigation and other advocacy strategies. We litigate in the United States under the Alien Tort Statute, the Torture Victim Protection Act, and other civil statutes. We are part of a global movement of NGOs that play a critical role in ending impunity. As of 2017, 
there were 68.5 million people around the world who had been displaced as a result of persecution, conflict, violence, or human rights violations. It is estimated that there are more than 1.3 million survivors of politically motivated torture currently living in the United States. It is also estimated that there are 1,750 human rights violators from 95 countries here in the United States. Thousands of human rights violators have found safe haven in the United States, including those with substantial responsibility for heinous atrocities. These abusers often live in the same immigrant communities as their victims. What is at stake here today at this hearing is ensuring a comprehensive response to impunity. It is imperative that Congress continue to expand legislation to strengthen efforts to hold human rights violators accountable through both civil and criminal avenues. To that end, we urge this commission to consider the following. One, expand the Torture Victim Protection Act to close an atrocity loophole by including a civil cause of action for war crimes, genocide, and crimes against humanity. Number two, adopt a Crimes Against Humanity Bill. Crimes Against Humanity was a crime charged at Nuremberg and has been supported by the United States since then and the crimes established at other tribunals. Three, modernize current atrocity crime statutes so that they apply to non-state actors and apply retroactively so that they eliminate the statute of limitations and ensure consistent application of the rules of jurisdiction. Four, include command responsibility as a basis for liability in all existing criminal human rights laws to ensure decision makers are held responsible. Five, increase the number of mutual legal assistance treaties between the United States and other nations to make investigations easier and less costly. Six, increase funding for the agencies responsible for international criminal accountability including the FBI International Human Rights Unit, DOJ's Human Rights Special Prosecution Unit, ICE's Human Rights Violators Unit, and the State Department's Office of Global Criminal Justice. Reject the proposed efforts to reorganize or dismantle the FBI's International Human Rights Unit. The United States must lead in the global effort to prevent mass atrocities and to hold accountable those responsible. If we do not want the United States to be a safe haven for war criminals, we must pass and enforce laws that hold them accountable. In short, pursuing accountability for mass atrocities is in our moral, legal, political, national security, and financial interests. Fortunately, ending safe haven for war criminals and confronting mass atrocities abroad has received strong bipartisan support including, as Chairman McGovern said, the recent passage of the Eli Wiesel Genocide and Atrocities Prevention Act. Yet more can be done, more should be done. I want to thank you very much for this opportunity to speak, and I look forward to your questions. Good morning. I'm Professor Beth Van Scock of Stanford Law, and I was also the Deputy to the Ambassador at Large for War Crimes Issues in the Office of Global Criminal Justice. So I'll draw on my experience as a human rights lawyer, a professor, and also a diplomat working in these areas. It's really an honor to appear before you today. I've long been an admirer of this committee, of this commission. Um, one, number one, with respect to your steadfast commitment to human rights, but also the spirit of bipartisanship that has really motivated it in these troubled times. This and is if, what I could, we need. if I could just say, uh, my co-chair, Congressman Chris Smith from New Jersey, couldn't be here today because of a personal uh, matter that he had to take care of, but, uh, but you're right, this is a bipartisan yeah. commission. and uh, Genuinely so. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, so following Dixon's scene setter, I thought I would delve into s some more specifics of some of the proposals that have been discussed in the earlier panel and today. Um, and at the risk of appearing um, greedy, I've <laughs> developed a wish list of 10, which I'll work through quickly. I'd be happy to take questions um, on any of them. Some of them are very discreet and technical as in terms of the statute of limitations, for example. Others are a little more far-reaching and ambitious, but I think all of them would contribute to the United States' ability to exercise leadership in this space to ensure accountability and to prevent against impunity. So number one, um, Congresswoman Omar, you mentioned crimes against humanity. We have no crimes against humanity statute. We can prosecute torture, female genital cutting, genocide, trafficking, terrorism, a whole range of international offenses, but no crimes against humanity statute. This is a glaring gap. So if there's a massacre of civilians, for example, that doesn't rise to the level of genocide, we can't prosecute that as such. If there's a policy of enforced disappearances where you can't prove the victims have been tortured, we can't prosecute that as such. 
or if there's an ethnic cleansing campaign based upon religious persecution. If you can't prove genocidal intent, we cannot prosecute that as such. In 2010, Senator Durbin introduced a bill that was a, a solid op opportunity. It never moved forward, but it could be revisited. So that's um, one area I'd like to see. Turning to our jurisdictional framework for all of these other crimes I've mentioned, including piracy, trafficking, et cetera, we can prosecute offenders who are, quote, present in, found in, or brought into the United States. Our war crime statute is a glaring exception to that. We can only prosecute war crimes either committed by or against US citizens. So for most war criminals hailing from Syria who are committing crimes against their compatriots, we have no jurisdiction over those acts. We could easily expand the War Crimes Act to include so-called present-in jurisdiction, which would remove this patchwork approach, regularize our penal code, and really signal that we are committed to prosecuting all international crimes in equal measure. Third, Dixon and Mr. Rubiki already mentioned the problem of command responsibility. We can prosecute individuals under a whole range of theories of responsibility, complicity, conspiracy, et cetera. Those don't necessarily reach superiors who are under a legal duty to supervise their subordinates and hold them accountable when they commit abuses. We have command responsibility in other areas of US law. So the Military Commission Act actually has a terrific formulation of that crime, as does our Law of War Manual that the Department of Defense has created. So it should be a relatively easy lift to apply that more broadly across our penal code. And these are the individuals who are likely to have the resources to come to the United States, so they might actually fall within our jurisdiction. Four, I imagine that a legislative proposal for this is in effect, but as was mentioned, the female genital cutting mutilation statute was declared unconstitutional. This deficiency could easily be cured with language to the effect of that the defendant or victim traveled in, used a channel of instrumentality or channel or instrumentality of interstate or foreign commerce or the act otherwise affected interstate foreign commerce. I think that's an easy fix. It should be done quickly so that um, we can better protect women and girls in this country from the practice. Fifth, our genocide statute, as originally drafted, had a more limited reach. We've now expanded it to include present-in jurisdiction, but those jurisdictional changes are not retroactive. As a result, we have no jurisdiction over genocidaires who hail from Rwanda, one of the most um, egregious genocides of our generation. We can only prosecute them for these immigration offenses. That's important, but it pales in comparison to holding them responsible for the underlying offense, which is genocide. Sixth, and turning to our immigration remedies, um, as been mentioned, we have a number of very specific grounds to prevent um, the arrival of individuals and to enable the removal of individuals, but we don't have a general persecutor bar. This was something that has been explored, but has, for whatever reason, never moved forward. If we could have a statute that allowed for any individual who participates in the persecution of others on a range of grounds, including religious persecution, ethnic, racial, etc., that would make it much easier to block those individuals from coming, and if they manage to find their way here, make it easier to remove them. And we could add female genital mutilation to that statute as well, if we were so inclined. Um, the mention of, of statute of limitations is incredibly important. We have ordinary visa fraud, and then we have extraordinary visa fraud. There's no reason why we couldn't extend the statute of limitations for individuals who conceal their involvement in international crimes then it would be, a, let's say, a 20-year statute of limitations and maybe leave ordinary visa fraud at the lower level so you don't have the abuses that you sort of hinted at in one of your questions. Um, seventh, although this hearing is mostly focused on governmental authorities and our criminal um, accountability, civil redress is incredibly important. I worked on those Salvadoran cases involving General Garcia and Vitas Casanova who were found in, in um, Florida. Those were the only remedies we had at the time because our criminal law didn't reach backward. Congress has enabled victims of a whole range of international law violations, terrorism, trafficking, modern forms of slavery, to bring civil redress, but the Supreme Court has significantly truncated the reach of the alien tort statute. So I, too, would like to see the Torture Victim Protection Act expanded to include other causes of action, war crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, at a minimum, and Congress could also um, amend or put something in the record that shows that the alien tort statute is expressly extraterritorial, so it can reach conduct that happened abroad. Eighth, if you'll bear with me, um, turning to institutional issues, I just want to add my remarks to the two previous panelists about the importance of retaining the, war, the FBI's War Crimes Office. They've been an incredible partner. They're essential to all of these um, investigations, and dispersing that expertise elsewhere in the Bureau is really going to limit our ability to lead on these issues. Ninth, um, 
while many of these proposals that we've discussed today are important and needed, there are existing human rights authorities that have been underutilized, and that I think was implicit in, in questions from both of you. There's only two cases that have invoked our torture statute. One resulted in a historic verdict, the other to a very favorable and appropriate extradition to Bosnia where the prosecution moved forward. All of our other statutes are essentially moribund. They've never been utilized. And so the question is, what is causing that? And I really encourage Congress, and I think this commission is a great example of Congress exercising its oversight to try and get to the bottom of what are the obstacles and what more can Congress do, civil society actors, others, to make these cases more possible to move forward so that we're not having to rely on these immigration remedies. And in fact, we can prosecute individuals for their underlying offenses. It might help to, re to hold hearings where DOJ and DHS can speak more candidly about what is What's, what the problem is, have some reporting um, opportunities for DO, DOJ and DHS to describe efforts and why those efforts have been thwarted. Um, I leave it to you to think what the best way to exercise this oversight is, but it would be great to see some of these statutes utilized in a substantive way. And finally, wearing my ex-State Department hat, um, and you, you mentioned this in one of your questions, um, Congressman McGovern, but you know, we, we still have a role to play in promoting accountability abroad, both from the perspective of international institutions, but also partner nations that are trying to do these cases the best that they can, like El Salvador with respect to the El Mazote massacre. We need to be supporting those efforts. We can do so through resources, through seconding personnel, through um, rule of law training, um, through empowering NGOs that are working in those areas. And while the international community has not created additional ad hoc tribunals in the way that they did in the mid-90s, there are a whole range of really innovative um, accountability mechanisms, including the IIIM that's dedicated to Syria, UNITAD that's dedicated to Iraq, the Special Criminal Court in the Central African Republic, NGOs and non-governmental organizations like the Commission on International Justice and Accountability that's creating war crimes dossiers that then they can hand off to our partners in Europe who are prosecuting dozens of these cases that we can be supporting as well. So that work, I think, needs to continue. And the Office of Global Criminal Justice is really the point person for that work. So maintaining the support for that organization, I think, is important. So with that list, um, I will rest. Putting these new authorities in place will ensure that the US has the tools that it needs to address the next cohort of persecutors who are inevitably going to make it here one way or the other um, after committing their crimes um, or repression in other states. And I'm hopeful that these proposals will find favor and inspire you and your colleagues to continue to strengthen the US legal framework from all perspectives, criminal law, civil law, immigration law, and diplomacy. I welcome questions. Well, thank you. Thank you both. And I, let me begin by saying I, I both I appreciate your dedication to these issues over the years um, and the work that you have done. And, um, and as, I, I, you know, as I said before, I think this is incredibly important. If we're talking about preventing mass atrocities from occurring, I mean, we need to make sure that there, it is clear that victims have rights and victims can get justice. Uh, and you, know, you mentioned El Salvador. Uh, which is very near and dear to my heart because I spent a great deal of my life in the 1980s traveling back and forth on various cases, the Jesuit murders and other human rights uh, abuses. But I, I always, um, you know, and you mentioned El Mazote where over a thousand, mostly children and women, were massacred. Uh, and at the time, the United States government denied that it happened. It wasn't until after the war and a forensics team went in and began to do it an excavation that they found this, all these bodies um, covered up in a shallow grave. Um, and, um, and that case is particularly, uh, it sticks in my mind because um, the unit, the battalion that carried out the massacre Avocado was created by the United States of America. Uh, and it's hard for me to believe uh, that um, we were totally in the dark about what was going on at the time I mean, we had military advisors in the area uh, at the time, and yet, he, you know, the amnesty law in El Salvador has been repealed, and they are they're trying to pursue a case against uh, uh, the, uh, the perpetrators of the Amazote massacre. And I believe that the United States government still has information um, in our intelligence agencies and in the Department of Defense that has, that has not been shared, uh, detailed information about who was there, um, and, uh, you know, and all the reporting that went back and forth. I mean, that would be a good s signal, I think. Um, we, you know, we're trying to get some language in the appropriations bills to instruct our intelligence agencies that ha where, where documents haven't been declassified to be able to provide that to the people who are prosecuting that case. Um, and, um, and it's really important because if you can't get justice in that case 
where a thousand people were massacred, there's no way you're going to get justice in individual cases. So I, I thank you for, for raising raising that, and um, and I also think, you know, and this is why these issues are important to me. You know, in the case of El Salvador, we were allied with the government and the military. I mean, I think we have a special obligation now to get it right. And you mentioned General Vitas Casanova, who was involved in the murder of the four American churchwomen in El Salvador, and yet he seemingly had no trouble coming to the United States, you know, and getting, you know, a permanent residency status. I mean, uh, yet we have people who write controversial poetry that are denied access to the United States. This was a guy who, you know, at, at a minimum was involved in the cover-up of the murder of four American churchwomen, and there he is, and you know, in the United States. Now, luckily, that case had an ending where, you know, he's been sent back. But, um, uh, but can you just share with us your experience and views on the U.S. government's use of extradition in relationship to accountability for grave human rights abuses, and how important is that? Uh, is it to address the problem of the international doctrine of, of uh, specialty? Yeah. So I think in general, the preference is always that the individual is prosecuted most closely to the events in question. I mean, that's their country's history, right? They should take the lead on that. So if they have the political will and the legal framework to do that, I think that is often preferable, that we use extradition if someone is here. That said, if someone has lived here for a long time, their victims are also here, there may be a reason that we would want to exercise our criminal jurisdiction over that individual, assuming we have the authorities to do so, and we have gaps in them, as we've, as we've discussed today. So it's always a careful balance, I think, as to where the most appropriate place is. I think where we get into trouble is where we extradite someone and it's a sham proceeding right. in the, the state of origin. And that we, I think, want to avoid. We have to see that there's actually a genuine commitment to prosecute that individual. Um, both, bo you know, so both of you offered a number of recommendations. I'm going to uh, keep you guys busy. Sorry. I, 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 I get, you know, and, I, and, and that's what part of this hearing is about. Is we, I mean, we want to be able to get these recommendations, and we want to be able to, uh, to be able to, you know, move them forward if we can. Um, but um, how, how do you prioritize the menu of reforms that you that you have proposed here today? What, 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 what's the top two, the top three things that we ought to do first? Because there are a lot of things that you recommended. Uh, so the top two or three things for the Center of Justice and Accountability, one, because we represent survivors and victims and the only avenue they have when perpetrators are found here in the United States is often using civil law, and that's the law that we're able to use, amending the Torture Victim Protection Act uh, so that it includes other atrocity crimes would uh, really assist. Uh, you know, we, the case that I mentioned earlier uh, of uh, our client Farhan Warfa, who was tortured, we were able to get the jury to find uh, the defendant uh, liable for the torture. But it prevented us from really painting a full picture of the crimes against humanity that took place under the Barr regime. And that is a story that victims and survivors want heard and told. They want the breadth of what happened uh, in their country told. So amending the Torture Victim Protection Act would be one, number one for us. But I think for the, the Department of Justice, they really need all tools in the toolbox. So actually passing a Crimes Against Humanity bill, you know, which the United States has supported since Nuremberg, and uh, all but one of our allies in NATO has a Crimes Against Humanity statute on their books, it is something that we need to do. And it's something that actually protects uh, members of the United States should another country want to uh, prosecute a US citizen. The fact that we have a similar law in the books here allows us to say that now, that is something that, that we would want to take care of and prosecute. So those would be my top two. Yeah, I would tend to agree, and I would also say some of these other bits and pieces we've talked about could, I imagine, be packaged into kind of a criminal law technical amendments act. So, I mean, the Crimes Against Humanity Act is going to be a heavy lift. I don't think either one of us is naive about that. But some of these other issues about extending the statute of limitations, maybe having the jurisdictional provisions of the Genocide Act be retroactive, having a persecutor bar, maybe those are not so much of a heavy lift. And so that would, I would also recommend thinking about kind of how to bundle those together into a piece of legislation that might move. And I appreciate the fact that uh, both of you drew attention to the crucial role played by non-governmental organizations uh, in pursuing accountability. What would be your top recommendation to sustain and strengthen non-governmental partners uh, in countries that you've worked in? That's a very good question, uh, Representative. Uh, let me give you an example of how you know, we collaborate globally and then with uh, our agencies here. 
Uh, we work with two sister organizations, uh, Civitas Maxima in Geneva and the Global Justice Research Project in Monrovia, Liberia. Uh, they've done incredible work documenting the crimes that took place during the two civil wars in Liberia. Uh, they've pr prepared criminal dossiers and they worked with uh, uh, DHS here to bring two immigration fraud cases against uh, Liberians who are living in Philadelphia. The Center for Justice and Accountability is also working with them and we brought another case against Moses Thomas, also who's living in Philadelphia, and we allege that he's responsible for what was called the Lutheran Church Massacre, where the Liberian Army went into a Lutheran church, which was a Red Cross designated site, uh, and massacred 600 uh, civilians that were seeking safety. And our, our clients survived by hiding under the dead bodies. Uh, what would be helpful is supporting this NGO civil society to the extent that there are funds available to advance their work, uh, to the extent that there are mutual legal assistance treaties between the U.S. and the government of Liberia. So if the U.S. wants to uh, pursue criminal charges in any of these cases, they have an ability to work with the government and have easier access to produce documents and witnesses. Uh, those are a couple of steps that the U.S. government could consider. Um, CJ has, has taken a civil case against the former defense secretary of Sri Lanka with the case we mentioned earlier. Are, are you able to comment on this case? or? Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, as you uh, alluded to, uh, uh, the former Secretary of Defense, Raja Pasca, uh, is a dual U.S. Uh, Sri Lanka citizen. Uh, what we allege is uh, that in the context of uh, the, the horrible massacre of 40,000 civilians in Sri Lanka at the end of their civil war, one of the most emblematic cases was the murder of a uh, famed uh, uh, reporter editor. Uh, Wikramatunga, Lasantha Wikramatunga. Uh, he was assassinated as he was leaving his house. You know, four men in motorcycles dressed uh, on black uh, killed him you know, in public and daylight. Uh, we think there's sufficient evidence to show that, that he is responsible uh, for that. And so we filed the case uh, and uh, the case is ongoing right now. This is a great example of a case that might be used to activate our War Crimes Act because he is a U.S. national right. and so he falls within that jurisdiction. Um, and it would also be a great case if we had a command responsibility or a superior responsibility statute because, you know, it's going to be hard to place him at the actual assassination. But if you can show he's up the chain of command and had command authority over the, the troops or the security forces that committed abuses, you can reach superiors using a superior responsibility statute. Yeah, and just my, my final question, uh, my colleague, uh, Congressman Omar, um, brought up the fact that President Trump has re recently mentioned the possibility of granting executive pardons to U.S. personnel convicted under U.S. law for atrocity crimes. Uh, I'd like to get your opinion on the record, what you think of that, uh, and do such pardons or statements supporting such pardons affect the position of the United States that perpetrators of atrocity crimes must be brought to justice? And then just one other thing, uh, and, and that is, I, I, you know, I'm, I get El Salvador on the mind today for some reason, but in going back to cases like the El Mazote case, um, you know, we, th there are the people who gave the orders and, you know, uh, and executed the crimes. Uh, but w w what is the accountability for U.S. citizens who may have known what's going on, turned the other way, or been part of the cover-up um, because that's one of the things that, that bothers me is that so much of what was awful that happened in this country in that country it is hard for me to believe uh, that uh, that there were people who are on our payroll who didn't know what was going on um, I investigated the murder of the Jesuit priest and um, I don't speak Spanish um, I never investigated anything in my life uh, you know, I watched the Columbo movie. I think that's probably my <laughs> extent of my investigative skills. But we were able to figure out that the Salvadoran Armed Forces, the Salvadoran High Command gave the order to kill the priest, and we were able to figure out who the triggermen were. Uh, you know, and I'm not the CIA or the DIA or whatever. It's just hard for me to believe that we could have figured it out and somebody else didn't know it. And if we got to want to you know, there needs to be some accountability there as well, but I give that to you. 
Representative Omar mentioned that the United States does not have a pristine record uh, on human rights accountability, including holding our own accountable. Uh, you just look back to post 9-11, and there has not been significant accountability for the decisions uh, around torture. They try to recast it as something else, but what was committed was torture. Uh, and the United States needs to deal with its own house, uh, as well as uh, no, uh, not in our own house. Uh, so that's one level of accountability that we've not achieved, and we need to continue to uh, raise that. Uh, but sir, you also mentioned uh, the, the suggestion of pardons for those who've uh, convicted war crimes. You know, the military justice system is a very strict system, and they have very high standards. And you know, if they have convicted members of their own, uh, you no know, fellow service members of having committed war crimes, to have a president step in and right. pardon them sends the worst possible signal uh, that you can imagine. And the world does watch. They, they look at the United States. You now, it is both a beacon for tremendous hope and then uh, you know, a concern when international institutions and the rule of law are under attack. Yeah, just to reiterate, I, I agree that I think it sends a terrible message. Um, and it also sends a terrible message to our men and women in uniform who every day are put in incredibly difficult situations and take their international law training and the laws of armed conflict really seriously. There is a rig rigorous justice system, and if those individuals were convicted by that justice system, then that was, a, I think it's fair to say that was a fair proceeding. But from my wearing my sort of diplomatic hat, it makes it very difficult for us to continue to promote human rights and accountability abroad when we're not. Um, providing it at home. Yield to my colleague. Um, is Skak? Skak, yeah. Skak. Rhymes with rock is what I always say. Ah, that's good. <laughs> um, I wanted, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the um, ICC. <coughs> we all have our criticisms of of ICC, but um, I was a little disappointed, um, maybe that's an understatement, in um, Secretary Pompeo's um, decision to uh, issue visa sanctions to the investigators. Um, Chairman McGovern and I wrote um, a letter um, asking series of questions on, on, on why this, this was happening um, and trying to get accountability for that. I find this decision to be uh, reckless and absurd. But, you know, this, this administration has been um, quite hostile um, in, in pursuing international mechanisms to justice. Uh, and so I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts are of, of that decision. Um, and do you agree it was a grave mistake? There's no question that the International Criminal Court has been subjected to criticism. The cases take too long. Sometimes the judgments are inscrutable. We don't understand why the judges have ruled the way they have. But sometimes it's the court of last resort. It literally may be the only place in which any form of accountability will be happening because the courts of the state in question are closed for whatever reason. The conflict is still ongoing, for example. So it's an important part of a system of international justice that I think we have to continue to try and make succeed. Um, I tend to agree with you that the decision to revoke the visa of the chief prosecutor, for example, who's been a champion of justice for much of her career was, was short-sighted. Um, it's not clear what it actually accomplishes vis-a-vis um, -vis actually making it difficult to do her work. She does come and brief the Security Council with, where we have a permanent seat and, I, and we have supported most of the cases moving forward before that institution are directly um, in parallel with U.S. foreign policy in those areas around accountability. It was only the Afghanistan preliminary examination that was raising some allergic reactions, and that now has been closed. So it's not clear why we need to continue to maintain this hostile relationship with what may be the court of last resort for many victims. Um, and you used to help run the um, Global Criminal Justice Office. Um, and as, as McGovern um, said earlier, that the FBI's uh, war crimes unit um, might go away because of reconfiguration of, of the department, and this office has also been threatened. Um, do you think we need to codify it to make sure that it is um, safe and, and protected? I think that would be incredibly helpful if there was some legislative hook 
that showed that, and, and I think providing some of the funding to GCJ, which you, Congress has done in the past vis-a-vis -vis the Syria conflict, is another helpful way to show the importance of that institution and to keep it centralized in a specialized office. And I think the FBI's office is in the same boat. I always knew when I was at state who to call if I had a situation that had an investigation sort of crossover or nexus. And if, if that expertise gets dissipated, I literally would not know what phone to call to, if, I need, if I had a case involving a perpetrator who I thought was potentially coming to the United States, et cetera. So having that centralized place is really crucial, and I think legislation would help. What do you think it says about us that, you know, um, offices like the FBI War Crimes Office is being threatened or the Global Criminal Justice Office is being threatened? How, how is that going to hurt our, our credibility? Well, it's a complete opposite trend to what we're seeing amongst our allies. So what we're seeing in Europe, and Eurojust was mentioned, is actually the creation of networks. Countries are creating specialized war crime units modeled on our system in order to talk together, to better share information, to better do mutual legal assistance, as Dixon has mentioned. And yet for us to then be dismantling those institutions and dissipating that expertise is completely counter to the trend of what our allies are doing. And it's going to make that more difficult for us to cooperate around cases that have transnational dimensions to them. So it's almost as if we're like the only country that is regressing. Um, and, and I say that because, you know, we have a president who's talking about pardoning um, U.S. personnel who might be accused of war crimes. We have a, a sitting congressman who says, you know, I, I shot civilians and took pictures with dead corpse. What's the big deal? Um, and, and to me, <laughs> um, I, I can't understand how in the United States we don't think these things are a big deal. Um, and so I just, I just hope that we figure out how to get ourselves back um, on track to the kind of progress we want to see in this country and, and in the world. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, Guantanamo. Um, We speak a lot about accountability um, in regards to what's happening around the world. Um, but human rights accountability really hasn't been in, in the forefront um, for, for us here um, domestically. And when it comes to um, Guantanamo, it seems like the way that we have conducted um, ourselves might speak um, to a different tone internationally. Um, wouldn't it probably make it easy for people like Assad or um, organizations like um, Taliban to say, you know, how can we demand accountability how can the United States demand accountability of us when they themselves um, are doing similar things? How can you say torture is wrong when you have dozens of men still locked up indefinitely in Guantanamo? And so <clears throat> are, we handling, are we handing them a propaganda win and how do we reverse the course? Uh, thank you for your question, Representative Omar. Uh, yes, uh, th there are leaders around the world who say don't talk to us about human rights when you need to clean up your own house, including Guantanamo. Guantanamo was a terrible stain uh, on the history of the United States. It was created as an, uh, uh, a prison that uh, would be outside of the laws of the United States. Um, I actually traveled to Guantanamo. I watched uh, one of the hearings there and was just appalled as they had a uh, no break because all of a sudden it was learned that uh, the CIA was listening in to the defendant's counsel talking to defendants. Uh, you know, a complete breach of, of, of client confidentiality. Um, one of the things that I, I'm proudest of uh, in my work history is that I, at Human Rights First, you know, worked with Senator McCain and Senator Levin to get the law changed so that the administration could start sending individuals who had been cleared by all the intelligence services 
uh, could be cleared and, and, uh, uh, and moved to, to third countries. So in my time, we were able to uh, reduce the prison population from 177 to 41. But we still have 41. And the blotch on our history is that our Article III federal courts are more than able to handle terrorism cases. They've handled hundreds and hundreds and hundreds very successfully. And the importance of them is that they provide due process of law. It's not a make it up as you go process, which is what we're having right now. Uh, politically, I don't know that we're there yet. It's going to be up to you to, to try to get through those political roadblocks. But ideally, you want individuals who've been accused of very serious crimes to actually go through the trial uh, and have due process. Uh, and that's the only way to start turning back uh, the clock on uh, the stain that Guantanamo presents. Yeah, and I'll, I'll say this because I think votes are called and we have to go. I mean, it, it really isn't always about just due process because I believe just because you are accused of a crime or convicted of a crime, that does not abrogate your human rights. And so what we are doing in our regular prisons, in our federal prisons and in places like Guantanamo um, are things that we speak extremely vocally against around the world. Uh, and, and so we have to make sure that the values that we espouse are the values that we carry out. Um, and so, thank you. Well, um, thank you very much. As uh, uh, Congressman Omar mentioned, we have, uh, we just call votes and there's 30 votes, so we're not gonna have you wait until we come back. We may have some more, more questions. I just want, I wanna thank you. Look, we, we do a lot of hearings in this commission dealing with you know, current mass atrocities that are unfolding. And, um, and you know, trying to figure out how do we deal with them once all hell is broken loose, right? Part of what this is about, too, is to figure out things we can do maybe to discourage future mass atrocities from occurring. How do we, how do, you know, how do we prevent uh, these horrific uh, crimes against humanity from, uh, from unfolding? And I think this is, this is key to it. So you've given us a lot of recommendations. I think we want to work with you. Uh, to try to put them into legislative form and to figure out, you know, how we can move some of this stuff forward to make it make it better. But I think this is incredibly important for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, one is, again, I think it, it helps deal with the issue of impunity and helps prevent future uh, mass atrocities from occurring. But also, um, I, I, I want to believe that if the United States of America stands for anything, we need to stand out loud and four square for human rights. Um, and we ought to be leading by example. Uh, and, um, you know, again, we, we, we have, from the previous panel, there have been some success stories that we can, that we can, we can point to. Uh, we need more of them. I mean, you know, we need to strengthen the office. We need not to eliminate, you know, uh, uh, you know, departments or agencies that are actually doing very good work on this. Um, this is really important, uh, I think, to our image around the world as well. I want to make sure that any person guilty of war crimes doesn't think for a second that the United States is a safe haven. Um, and that's what bugged me about the El Salvador stuff. I keep on going back to El Salvador. Is that so many of these creeps, these 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 human rights violators, thought that it was that they could they could come here and get safe refuge. They could live their life out the rest of their life here, and you know, and that was okay. And I think they probably felt that way because we were allied with them during the 1980s. But we need to we need to make it clear that they're not welcome here. And if they come here and we find them, they're gonna be held to account. So I thank you for being here and we look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. Thank this you. ends the hearing, thank you.